Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Connecting K-12. Sorry, a little technical difficulty there. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Connecting K-12 and Higher Education Through the Use of Performance Assessments. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, we have a few minutes to make sure everyone gets logged in and online. I'd love for some of those who are on the, ch on the webinar right now to use the chat function to let us know who you are. Um, if you've attended one of our webinars before, maybe identify um, your organization or who you are and just kind of start practice and kind of warming up our um, chat room um, as we wait for others. Um, as many of you are probably aware, you can engage in discussion in the chat throughout the webinar. And please choose panelist and attendees from the drop down in the chat box so everyone can see the responses. Um, hey, I saw Mike Riley, one of our partners. Welcome, Mike. We'll be listing resources we share in the chat throughout the webinar. In fact, the slides are currently available in the link at the link in the chat box. If you have questions, please submit them using the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen as well. I'd also like to let the audience know that this webinar is being recorded. A video recording along with a summary of the webinar content will be emailed to you in a few days. So this means my stumbling over words will be well recorded at this point. This is the third in the series of three Reimagined College Access and Success webinars. Today's webinar will build on the first two webinars. The first webinar described performance assessment and highlighted the outcomes for students who scored below the admissions cutoff for standardized college entrance exams and were admitted to City University of New York based on performance assessments. The webinar was based on a study LPI is releasing today, Assessing College Readiness Through the Use of Authentic Student Work how the City University of New York and the New York Performance Standards Assessment are collaborating towards equity. The study was conducted by Michelle Fine and Karina Prionka and can be found on our website starting today. We're really excited about this report. It provides the evidence that a lot of folks are looking for in this field. Our second webinar shared how the higher education institutions have integrated performance assessment in their admissions process. It included our partner, Lula Common App, who works with SlideRoom, for students to submit student work through a portal. Wheaton College, one of the five RCA piloting sites in New England, and MIT, who has been using student work as part of their admissions process for almost a decade now, were featured. The institutions shared in detail the how-tos and the lessons learned, as this is a very iterative process admissions officers take on. Today, we are concluding this three-part series with a focus on K-12, as we explore why and how secondary schools can align their performance assessments for their use in higher education to advance college access and success. We now begin the formal part of our presentation. My name is Monica Martinez and I am the Director of Strategic Partnerships where one of the initiatives I support is Reimagining College Access, a partnership of the Learning Policy Institute and Educational and Education Council. Dan Gordon and Joan Fretwell from Education Council helped create and support this webinar. For those of you who are not aware of RCA, we began in 2017 when LPI and Education Council brought together a group of individuals and organizations in higher education admissions, placement, advising, and performance assessment to explore the value of using K-12 performance assessment to improve the decisions around quality and equity by providing better information. As you can see from the slide, partners include the National Association for College Admissions Counseling, the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, state department leaders, school networks like Link Learning, Envisions, Great Schools Partnership, the Mastery Transcript, the Coalition for College, and Making Caring Common. Following this 2017 exploratory meeting, three task forces were created to shape the initiative. As this slide shows, through a combination of task force meetings and convenings with a network of interested individuals and organizations over the last two or three years, a specific set of recommendations were made aimed at achieving RCA's vision. Ed Council and LPI enacted these recommendations over the past few years, including Ed First supporting us in launching a pilot program last fall, 2019, to use performance assessment in admissions at Castleton University, Clark University, Pine Manor College, Southern New Hampshire University, and Wheaton College through the Common App in partnership with SlideRoom. 
With the increase in the number of higher education institutions that have gone test optional, RCA seeks to connect two trends in education, the use of high quality performance assessments in K-12 to drive deeper learning and better post-secondary preparation, and the use of more holistic approaches to increase college access and success for students, particularly those who are most underrepresented. As I reference when we begin this webinar, today's webinar addresses performance assessment in higher education, but we are also releasing the report, Assessing College Readiness Through Authentic Student Work, that describes the teaching assessment systems of schools in the New York Standards Performance Consortium and how the work that students produce through these schools can inform college admissions, and more specifically, how CUNY uses performance assessment for admissions to their four-year colleges for students who do not meet the cut score for, ACT, for the SAT. The report presents evidence that shows students admitted to CUNY based on their performance assessment on average achieved higher first semester college GPAs, earned more initial course credits, and persisted in college after the first year at higher rates than peers from other New York City public schools. We're really excited to release this report today. Today we have three experts in college admissions to explore how to use and align performance assessments to higher education. We have David Hawkins, who is the Executive Director for Educational Content and Policy at NACAC, where he has worked for the past 20 years and will bring a perspective from college admissions counselors. NACAC represents college admissions counseling professionals dedicated to fairness, equity, transparency, and professionalism in college admissions. David has been working with RCA from the very beginning as he really helps rethink college access and success. Clea Joseph is the manager of College Readiness for Internationals Network. Clea is responsible for building the capacity of school staff across the Internationals Network schools to support college access and success. And last but not least, Chris White, an educational coach for High Tech High Graduate School of Education's Carpe College Access Network and executive director of college counseling for High Tech High Network for the past 19 years. Additionally, Chris has served on the External Admissions Committee for the University of California, San Diego since 2004. So how this will work today is I'll pose some questions to the panelists to kick off the conversation, and then we'll also turn to address questions from the audience. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to engage in discussion, you can click the chat button at the lower right side of your screen and type in the chat box to everyone and panelists. It'd be great if you identified your institutional affiliation, if possible. With that as context, I'd like to welcome my panelists for today. Great. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you for the time and preparing for this and, and being part of this today and taking an hour out of your day. Um, we're gonna start with Chris and Kalia. And to ground us, I wanna start by asking about the student competencies that are developed, the teaching and assessment practices at High Tech High and International Networks for schools. And also talk with David about what higher education could be looking for or are looking for. So Chris, we'll start off with you. Tell us a little bit about your students at High Tech High. Who comes to your school? How do they learn? And how do you know they are learning? Thank you. Certainly an honor to be here. Welcome, um, everyone. And hello from sunny San Diego. Um, uh, Mandy, if you could just uh, throw up the first slides there, uh, just to provide a little bit of the context of the High Tech High network um, and our um, learning environment. Um, we have four design principles. Um, personalization, equity, authentic work, and collaborative design. Um, I won't go through all four of them. I will highlight uh, for the purpose of this, today's conversation, two of them um, in the essence of equity. Um, you can see from a member's perspective, about 50% uh, of our students are Pell eligible or on the free and reduced lunch program, 47% um, uh, first generation, um, and a majority are students of color, 44% uh, Latinx and 10% black. Um, but beyond just the numbers, uh, we are also um, culturally responsive uh, in terms of like teaching pedagogies and a part of the abolitionist uh, teaching network. Um, and then the authentic work piece to provide a little bit more detail um, 
uh, project-based learning is the core of our work, and so students engage in projects that matter to them, uh, to their teachers, and to the, the broader uh, society. Um, and then just to dig one layer deeper, um, if you could go to the next slide, um, we ascribe to the deeper learning competencies. So our students are assessed in areas, and, and you can see the six competencies here. Um, and again, I, I might reference them later on as, as maybe we uh, kind of look at and, or answer some of the specific questions. Um, but um, how these competencies are assessed, um, currently, um, qualitative comments, every quarter our students receive comments from their teachers um, and, um, and, and of course they're kind of assessed relative to the, uh, the six deeper learning competencies. Um, we do provide letter grades. Um, students do have presentations of learning. Um, where they present uh, quarterly about the work that they've mastered, um, and then through student-led conferences. So um, in a nutshell, that's the High Tech High Network, and as I mentioned earlier, I may reference um, some of these uh, points um, later on. Great. Thank you so much, Chris, for, for grounding us in the work of High Tech High. Clea, would you do the same for the International Network? Sure. So our students are recently arrived immigrants. Um, they're multilingual um, lingual learners. And so a, one of our schools in New York City can have, um, a, you know, maybe 42 native countries represented, 22 languages spoken. Our students are first generation, first, you know, to go to college. Um, but I think what's really unique is that our classrooms and what's up is our core principles. So I'll speak to just the first two. Um, our classrooms are um, heterogeneous. So our students are grouped by language, English level, grade level, um, a lot of activity-based and group-based learning. Um, we really emphasize uh, students' home language and cultures being ing integrated into the curriculum. And so, you know, again, project-based learning is a big part of, you know, how we know our students are being successful. And so students are demonstrating that through literary essays, research papers, scientific lab reports, reflections, or even we have a, a native language proficiency, proficiency um, and um, that really kind of demonstrates, um, you know, what students are learning. And, you know, so I'll continue to talk about that throughout the talk as well. Great. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, let's dig a little bit deeper into some of the work you all do and tell us how this kind of learning and assessment practices that your students engage in at your school prepare students for college. Um, another way I like to say it is, what will make them successful in college because they attended a school like yours? I'll go and go yeah, first. Would, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Clea, go ahead, Clea. You got no, it. <laughs> go ahead, Chris. Um, thank you, sorry. Um, I think when I, so I'll, I'll, the first one I'll mention, and I'll kind of refer to our deeper learning competency of uh, learn how to learn. Um, and kind of reform, uh, kind of uh, support that with an example. Um, but I do think that like, learning, learning, learning how to learn. And our students, um, when they're approached with difficult content um, and challenging and rigorous um, learning, um, our students are really trained on how to learn. And so, example of that actually, um, I just kind of reconnected with a, a graduate from last year. Uh, first generation student went on to Pitzer College, and he shared with me. He just said, Chris chemistry was so, so hard. Um, got through it and actually did well, got an A in the class, but it was very, very difficult. So I just asked him, obviously, how did you get through that class? What were the things that you, you know, did? And, and it's things that we would naturally kind of want a student to do, but he really put them in practice. So he was the one who facilitated small groups. He kind of looked around, this is a difficult thing, kind of leaned on his project-based learning and collaboration, uh, got the students' groups together, um, and of course brought in the faculty, really felt comfortable in engaging faculty. Um, and so he really felt um, that through that experience and learning how to learn, um, got him through a very difficult course. Thank you so much, Chris. Clea, tell us a little bit more about some of the competencies that you guys develop that really enable your students to be successful in higher education. Right, I actually agree with Chris, you know, for us similar, our students, ability to advocate for themselves. I think especially because students are coming in, um, newly arrived immigrants, they've been in the country for um, years or less. Um, and so the advocacy part is really important, who to go to, you know, when you need help. Um, and, you know, I've seen that we have, we host interns and our interns are graduates from the network. And so, you know, being able to engage with them and talk to them about their college experience as they're in it 
in that moment. I always see that the advocacy piece shows through, even as they, they're interning for us and need support, um, which, is, which is important to see, you know, to see them um, take an, an internship, be serious about this internship, but then also have the ability to recognize, like, how to grow. Um, and, and I think that those things are very important and things that they're learning at our schools, again, with the group learning as well, collaborating with others. Um, I think it's just such an important uh, factor in co when attending college. So I think that those are the two things um, that make our students stand out, you know, sitting in front of the classroom, just, you know, those little nuances in terms of what really can make you successful um, when attending college. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I hear this time after time, schools like yours um, around the ability to learn how to learn. And the fact that you take your students through such an intense um, feedback and learning loop where they're constantly getting feedback from teachers and from outside members. So they're constantly improving their work. Um, I can hear how comfortable they are to advocate like what you said, Kalia and, and Chris, how comfortable they are to approach a faculty member because they're used to integrating and asking for feedback and support. So the, the agency as well as the learning to learn is amazing. David, what, what do you higher education members what are they looking for, higher education institutions in, in admissions, and, and, and how could they know more about these types of competencies um, that Chris and Clea have just talked about? First of all, thank you, Monica, for having, having me on this, on this webinar. I, I'll, I'll answer your question by, by uh, noting how, how significant what Clea and Chris just said um, is, it, and that is that in college admission, you know, they obviously look at a range of factors. Uh, they look at factors like the high school grades and the college admission test scores and essays and recommendations and such. Um, and that gives them a, a pretty good overview of what a student has, has accomplished. But what most admission officers will tell you at selective uh, admission colleges is that there's a lot we don't know about what makes students successful in college. And I think that if, if I had to share what you know, over the last decade or so, what, what admission officers have, have most been looking for, or actually this extends uh, well beyond uh, the last decade, but it's certainly reached a point in the last decade where I think we've gotten some critical mass. Uh, we've seen it labeled a number of ways. We've, we've, we've heard about non-cognitive factors. We've heard about grit. We've heard about moxie. We've heard about character. And all of those things are important. Advocacy is incredibly important. Self-advocacy, uh, learning how to learn. You know, all of these sort of paint a much broader three-dimensional, multi-dimensional picture of students that we really don't get through the, the paper online application process. Um, so I think that, that it's, it's that unexplained uh, variance that a lot of admission officers have, have really been trying their best to, 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 to go after. And the way we, we hear it talked about is, you know, holistic admission and, uh, and, and you know, sort of comprehensive review uh, but what, what I think you'll hear most from admission officers is that really what students do in high school is the single best predictor of their success in college. And it's also the most, most important thing if you really think about it. You know, it's, it's, it's what a student actually learned and how they engage with their educational uh, experience. And so that, that is where I immediately, Monica, you mentioned I was, have been in, in this um, RCA initiative since the start. It's where I immediately recognized that performance assessments provide a lot of that. They really provide a lot of the depth that a, a straight up transcript or, or GPA doesn't provide about what a student is capable of doing. And of course, college admission ranges from just minimally you know, ensuring that a student can succeed all the way up to, to making more nuanced decisions about, you know, well, how do we craft the student body at this highly selective college? And in any of those contexts, having access to this depth of information is going to help. Uh, particularly as it adds depth to the um, to the high school record. And the last thing I'll say is that another thing that they want, it's not necessarily from high school students, but they want something that they can demonstrate to others. So I'm thinking campus leaders, alumni, legislators, and policymakers about how these things actually do correlate to student success in college. Because it's easy to show correlations between quantitative measures. But what's, what's better in a way is being able to say, well, look at how this set of skills aligns with success at our institution. So that in a, in a nutshell, I think is, is, is what we're after these days. 
Thank you so much. Um, Clea and, and Chris, I wonder if you want to build a little bit more on that, hearing what David has su suggested about kind of this arc of conversation with admissions officers about what they're looking for. And I also wonder if you could address how you develop the core content. We had a question about that from one of our uh, participants. Sure, I'll, I'll start. And, and, and David, thank you for that um, summary of, of kind of what colleges are looking for, you know, beyond, you know, the, the, the grades and the test scores. And, and, I, and I think I would just build upon it and, and having, you know, had experience in, in admissions and then now the last 19 years on the high school side. Um, and I guess I would summarize my experience in this way. I, I wish colleges knew the students' stories, not how they write about them, but how they live them. I mean, it's, a, it's an aspirational statement, clearly. Um, but again, having served on both sides of the desk, um, that is, that's, that's truly what we, as we support our students in the college application process, and of course their learning experience, is what we're trying to aspire these students to do, you know, in their kind of one dimensional application. Um, and, and so that's the challenge, that's the, that's the bar um, that we set for our students. Um, in terms of the, the learning environment, and again, obviously, High Tech High is not, you know, the original project-based learning school, and of course, the only one that offers, uh, you know, ascribes to the deeper learning competencies. Um, we do feel, though, that is, those competencies um, really serve the students best. Um, and again, not just, not just obviously as they transition to high school to college, but obviously college into life and beyond. Oftentimes, uh, our alums will, will come back and, and reaffirm a statement that we say, you know, high tech high, you know, traditional schools prepare students for the first year of, high, of college, or high, uh, high tech high prepares students for the last two years of college and beyond. Um, and, and again, that's where those deeper learning competencies, uh, competencies come in, and, and we're going to stand strong on those and really kind of make sure that our students are walking away from, uh, from our school and our education with those competencies. Yeah, Clea, do you want to add before we move on to the next question? Sure. I, I definitely really like what Chris said about, you know, um, wishing that colleges knew student stories and how they live them. And I think that with our students, again, being um, newly arrived immigrants, English language learners, um, our model is set up for them to learn English, which is hard in itself. And so it's a lot of native language um, integration in our classrooms. And so I think that is important. And I wish that colleges could, you know, really understand how students are tackling this task, right, of graduating high school in New York City, but also learning English, um, which is a big deal and, and, and should be rewarded. Um, and it's a competency in itself, right, because it's not hard to learn another language. Um, so, you know, that's something I would add. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and I'll just add to the person who answered the question, uh, everything that Chris and Kalia said, but also content is not taught, and you can hear this from Kalia, in isolation. It's really taught across all the courses in through an interdisciplinary integrated way so that students are able to have conceptual understanding of academic knowledge and to be able to apply that to different situations as well as other disciplines. So I just wanted to add that in there because sometimes um, you guys just don't brag enough about the work you do and, and how well you prepare students around agency and learning to learn and collaboration um, and, and to accept feedback and to grow, but also they, they come out as, as true intellects who engage in, in serious discourse within these schools at all these levels. I want to keep moving this along and I hope that folks have a good understanding or some understanding of, of both of these designs. Um, because this one is a little bit more, I guess, about an opinion in some ways, but how do you think that the use of performance assessment in higher education or this kind of teaching and assessment that you both do can really kind of help and facilitate and support college access and success for students who are traditionally underserved? Um, and, and this could be students of color, English language learners, low income students. Um, Chris, you talked a little bit about the one dimensional application. So let's talk, a, let, let's lead, lead with you and ask about and, and talk about how this can really provide equity in college access and success. I love it. I, being a first gen student myself, um, thank you for this question. And it, it truly is what fuels me um, day in, day out to do this work. Um, and so if I can have our High Tech High Elevate slide. Um, shared with the group. Um, so we've been fortunate, the High Tech High Network, you know, six high schools, 2,700 students, 
Um, we, uh, we established a college access initiative called High Tech High Elevate. Um, about three years ago, uh, we started it. And within that, obviously, we have some very strong relationships with universities, and, and we're growing this partnership with universities to, to kind of really look at and, and, and pilot, right, performance assessments in the college admissions process. So this slide here, as you'll see, uh, our three partners in University of Redlands, University of Richmond, and Gettysburg College, um, um, have, we work closely with them to, um, to of course, support for, specifically for first-generation low-income students. Um, and to your specific question, uh, you know, what are those elements that we add into um, this admissions process um, beyond the, the, the grades and test scores um, and really encouraging these colleges and these colleges coming to us saying, we want to emphasize and put more weight on these elements of essays, um, interviews, recommendations, um, specifically a resiliency statement um, from these students and digital portfolios. Um, and I, I want to highlight, there's five, five comments from our partner colleges here, but two I really want to highlight. Um, one being uh, the first one there in the kind of the left corner, learn so much more depth to their student stories than an application or essay prompt could ever convey. Um, and what I, what, what's behind that statement is, you know, essays and the prompts, and, and, and Common App obviously does great work in, in really being mindful and thoughtful. I was able to serve on the Common App Board of Directors and, and understanding the thought that goes behind the essay prompts. However, from a first-generation student perspective, they don't always, they, it doesn't come natural to them to really kind of put out their stories of resilience. So it's oftentimes how you couch what you want them to respond to and be more explicit and what they're responding to. So we actually have resiliency statements that we share with the group. Um, and then the other one is I am, uh, so at bottom left, I am better prepared to talk about some of the challenges and differences coming to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania from San Diego, California. Um, to David's point, right? Like through the traditional application, an admissions reader won't really kind of get those things out of an application to truly understand what some of the challenges that a student has experienced in their K-12 education and what are those challenges that they may experience as they leave San Diego and go to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania um, and the support systems that are needed in order for that, that to successfully, that matriculation to successfully happen, retention, of course, graduation. So, um, so this has been a wonderful pilot program that we've been able to work and really implement in performance assessment and, and, and hopefully kind of grow and expand from what we've learned in these relationships with these uh, higher education institutions. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, Clea, how do you think the use of, of um, the teaching practices at your school and performance assessment um, lead to equity in college access and success? Um, so I think that one of the things that we try to do in terms of building partnerships um, is really offering students and programs and op not teachers and programs an opportunity to understand our model um, and, and have that reciprocity. So, you know, for instance, um, CUNY has a program called CLIP, which is, which is their language immersion program where students oftentimes may place into um, because they still need to develop their English language skills. And so one of the things that we did was, you know, get, have an opportunity to invite people from CLIP, from the different CUNY campuses to internationals and get a chance to experience the international model, visit the classroom, talk to students, talk to uh, teachers, look at our rubric, um, look at examples, exemplar work of our PBAT, um, but then also give our teachers an opportunity to learn about the CLIP program and what CLIP is expecting our students to do um, at the same token, wanting CLIP to understand where, what our students are learning, what are they doing in the classroom, um, how are they prepared um, to enter into a CLIP program, and what can we do differently on both ends. And so wanting to take this a step further and continue this work and allow for our teachers at some point um, to be able to visit the CLIP program and visit the classrooms and see how their classes are grouped, um, how they're doing collaborative work, how their students are learning, um, and to be able to really take that back and sort of promote success in these programs. Great. Thank you so much. And I don't mean to leave um, David last, and he is not least, but we'll move over to the higher ed admissions side. And David, talk to us a little bit about how you think the use of performance assessment can lead to um, equitable practices around college access and success. Well, what, what strikes me most probably is that 
the use of performance assessments is not bottled up in a certain segment of schools. It is truly being implemented in all sorts of schools across the US and in different um, geographic regions with different demographics. And I think that um, that right off the bat shows that there's something happening in the secondary schools that is more evenly distributed than a lot of the other uh, metrics that, that, that college admission offices look at um, are. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is, again, we're, we, we know that the, we being admission officers know that the inequities in our education system lead to fairly calcified and predictable outcomes with regard to the measures that we currently use, grades, test scores, GPAs, all that kind of thing. Um, so we're, we're painfully aware of the limitations there. And, and I think it's, it's my hope, but I think it's also, a, a, I think it's been borne out as a, as a, as, as a side effect or a, or a main effect of, of performance assessments is, is that we uncover more about what makes people engaged in education and what makes them successful because that is different in almost every person but we certainly have enough evidence to see that it, it it is it can be affected by where you live or what your income is or things like that so the performance assessment i think adds enough depth and enough ways to demonstrate capacity talent you name it um, that that it can broaden the field and give us more as admission officers to hang our hats on when we make these decisions and sometimes in very high stakes uh, circumstances. So yeah. that's how, you know, that's the promise that, that I certainly see and I think a lot of our institutions would see as well. I love the language you're, you're using around depth and expanding and broadening the measures. And again, Chris using the word that right now we have kind of a one dimensional application to use the word calcified, which is great. Uh, Common App has used that as well. I wonder, David, if we can just stick with you for a little bit and, and maybe you can help us um, as K-12 folks Think about how we help higher education understand um, students and their experiences who attend schools like those in the New York Consortium, New Tech, Big Picture, High Tech High, um, and international schools, all these schools that engage in these inquiry-based approaches with a more robust assessment system. How do we help higher ed understand that? Sure. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a few ways, and I apologize if I cross over questions, but but this is, I think there's a, there, I would say there's three really important things. Number one is that um, higher ed admission officers need to be educated about this phenomenon. Um, and I'm not suggesting that there's any deficiency there. It's just that this is relatively new to them. And I think that, um, that what, what is really important is just to familiarize everyone, because at the you know, obviously at at the high levels the deans the vice presidents they're you know they they may have heard of this they may understand it pretty well but what you also have is a lot of young people working in college admission offices and they're doing two really important things one they're talking to students and families and they're interacting with the schools that are doing these performance assessments so they need to understand what this is all about and then on the back end they're reading applications so they need to know what this this phenomenon is so that they can understand it when they see it in an application the second piece is, and that's a long slog, I'll say. I've been saying that since the very beginning. That is something we have to do because there's a lot of turnover in admission, and it just takes any population of people a long time to learn a new concept. So that's a, that's, yeah, we're in this for the long term. Uh, the second thing is that uh, school counselors can play a particularly important role. And right now, um, school counselors are quite overwhelmed in a lot of areas, particularly in areas where you have a lot of underrepresented, underrepresented students, disadvantaged students um, in higher education. So the, the role of the school counselor is potentially important, or if you don't have a school counselor, someone who can fulfill the role of a school counselor to articulate to colleges and universities what this program is all about, what your students are picking up, how it manifests itself down the road, and what your objectives are. There, that, that, that conversation between K-12 and higher ed is very important. And in an organization like NACAC, it's sort of what we do. It's, it's, those conversations come to life in these spaces. The third and final thing I'll mention, and, and Monica, you can signal me if we're not ready for the school profile question yet. No, are we not? Ready? Go, go for it. it. Well, the school profile is something that's been around for a long time, but not all schools have them and not all schools have them in a way that really helps college admission officers. But this is the school profile is literally the first line. Of, I don't know, I think it's line of defense, but it's the first 
piece of information a lot of college admission offices will see about your school. And when we're talking about performance assessments, it's really important for us to be able, as high schools, to be able to articulate to college admission offices what it is our school is all about. So NACAC has just put out a, um, uh, a set of recommendations for school profiles. And um, it, I see the link is already there in, in the chat, but one, a couple of important things. Number one is to have one and to make it easy to find. And that sounds really basic, but 60, only 62% of schools in the high free and reduced price lunch um, category even had a school profile. So you're talking about, you know, 40% of schools don't even have one of these documents. Um, the key elements that we really recommend, you obviously want to provide context about your school. You want to, you want to provide staff contacts uh, because you'd be amazed at how many schools don't have a staff contact so that the admission officer can pick up the phone and call. But what's really central to this um, discussion is that we want schools to be able to, to describe the curriculum that they use and the grading system that they use. That will, that will be so helpful to a college admission officer uh, who, who really doesn't have very much time to process a lot of the information that's coming their way. Uh, so if you look at that document, you'll see, I think, a lot of tips about how to lay that out. In the case of performance assessments, just really critical to be able to convey all of the different skills that, that Chris and Kalia have talked about uh, in a way that, that admission officers can easily reference. And that's those, those things all combined, I think, um, K-12 has a very affirmative and very important voice in that conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for that, David. And, and it might seem like a small thing to some folks, but as David said, school profiles are so important. Um, Envision Schools, who has been part of RCA for some time, when David told them about the use of school profiles and how important it is to admissions officers, he was like, you know, what? I'm going to go back and make sure all my schools are doing this. And there's, um, there's a great comment um, in the chat as well about a, a recovering admissions officer who has nightmares finding school profiles um, and the fact that we need to think about best practices. The other thing I want to call out that both Chris and Clea talked about were partnerships and relationships with K-12. That's really what made the CUNY um, and consortium pilot work, is that the admissions officers reached out to the consortium schools and they started thinking more about this in a deeper way. But also then they began to trust this, the, the school and how they were preparing students and began to trust the assessment system. Um, because it goes back to David's point that they need to know what to look for. But it's all about relationships, partners, and and trust. And so, um, Clea, let's start with you. I'll actually break, break my um, habit here of leading with Chris. Let's start with you, Clea, and talk about how you help higher education understand your students, the kind of learning they have, the assessment they do. Um, is, is there anything you do to help admissions officers or higher institutions understand your students at a deeper level as well as your schools? Yeah, I think that David hit a lot of the key points um, are, you know, the school profiles, you know, for our schools that will submit PBAC um, to universities or, you know, for even something like a posse scholarship, um, it's important that they do um, share the school profile, share the rubric. Um, but then also what's really helped us is inviting admissions officers, you know, you know, I know the schedule is pretty crazy, but inviting them to the school to really get a chance to sit in a classroom and really experience it firsthand. Um, because I think that there's something, um, you know, just, just, just very unique um, in, in that experience. And again, because our students, you know, for them to be able to see the language immersion that we're doing as well, I think it's really hard to kind of um, sum it up in a school profile. It, it really kind of takes it a notch um, if, if an admissions officer is able to come to the school. So our partnerships, definitely get um, uh, forged, but it takes it up another level if they're able to come and visit the school, come and, and speak to students, um, then they really, really get it. Um, and really, you know, to your point, Monica, want to engage with us and trust our assessment process. So important. Chris, can you share some of the ways that you've really kind of um, opened up this black box of, of deeper learning to higher ed institutions so they understand your students and what they bring? Absolutely, and 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 the, the the through line through all now my third comments, adding on to David and, and Kalia, is that is that relationship and partnership, and and specifically nothing new to what Kalia. I think I would just add in terms of the visits. Um, again, having been that what we would call road warriors in admissions and, and visiting high schools, um, I understood the business of admissions, and so coming to the high school side, 
Um, and perhaps maybe that's one suggestion for a system or a school or a district looking to move towards performance assessment is really look to NACAC to help connect with higher you know, admissions professionals who want to make the jump to the K-12 side uh, because there obviously is so much information and, and knowledge and experience that comes along with them um, when, when you make that jump to the other side. Um, and, and specifically, I'll share a specific example of the high, the high school visits when the college representatives come, what I specifically do, and th this was 17, 18 years ago when we started High Tech High and bringing those admissions representatives, yes, the goal was for that admissions counselor to present their information about the university or the college. But more importantly for me, it was for them to walk away with a deeper understanding of our learning environment, the, le the deeper learning competencies, and of course, project-based learning. So what I would do have the admissions representative present uh, or sh uh, introduce themselves, but then also allow the students in the room to introduce themselves and talk about a project, their 30 minute, you know, their, their 30 minute, 30 second elevator speech about a project that they're working on. Um, and so specific example, and this was again, 17 years ago, um, I was three years into the world with High Tech High. We were brand new on the scene. We hadn't seen any student uh, admitted to Stanford uh, up until that point. Um, I knew Stanford was visiting the local San Diego private schools, but they weren't visiting us. So I knocked on their door, knock, knock, knock. They finally came, um, did that kind of protocol with the visit. As I walked admissions representative out, she, I remember it vividly, she told me, Chris, well, your students are doing graduate level research. I said, absolutely. That same cycle, we had three students admitted to Stanford. Um, no coincidence. To Kalia's point, under, got a deeper understanding of the level of work that the students were accomplishing and doing, um, and um, and 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 when you see that one-dimensional application come through, all of a sudden it's no longer one-dimensional. Um, they have, to, to David's point, they have the profile, um, they have that trust now in the environment that uh, that these students are coming from. Without AP courses, we don't uh, we don't um, our students don't take advanced placement courses. So, so again, it's just kind of that reaffirming of an understanding of what our students are graduating with. Yeah, getting lots of kudos um, in the chat, Chris, for bringing that admissions role to a high school so that you can really kind of bridge and connect that um, the two systems, like what we're talking about today. Um, so, I appreciate you you sharing that. Um, and and I remember, Chris, you said like Stanford again um, was like looking at your students and saying. This, these are the kind of intellectual kind of students who want to be challenged by the rigors of college. These are the students we want by showing them how students um, are problem solving and applying what they learn. And so really using deep critical thinking skills. I appreciate that. We're going to start moving to the um, questions from participants and we have a few. Um, and one of the questions that has continuously come up at these um, webinars is around the, the, the potential inequity of um, performance assessments. And um, some folks wonder if performance assessment in higher ed can actually um, exasperate or continue inequitable um, admissions practices. And so I'll just kind of look to see who takes himself off mute to see who wants to kind of address the question um, around um, the potential of performance assessment to continue to, um, to lead to inequity in admissions, David? Sure, I, and I think, you know, Monica, the, the, the reason the question comes up is that we've had enough experience with college admission over the, the course of its modern lifetime to know that, um, you know, money and, and socioeconomic issues and, and all sorts of other cross-cutting phenomena tend to find a way to, um, I'm, I'm going to use the word corrupt at risk of, of sounding, you know, maybe a little hyperbolic, but 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 they do exercise an, an outsized influence on college access. I mean, we saw it in in vivid relief with the with the of uh, Operation Varsity Blues scandal last year. And I, I think it it even though that was clearly a bribery problem that was against the law, it it just unearthed this this whole locked up not necessarily locked up but but just a very common concern. So the 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 to answer your question, I do think that. Um, we have to be careful. We have to make sure that as we institute performance assessments in our secondary schools, that we equip the schools to do what they need to do. Um, I do think that it has a democratizing effect only because if we can get it into the admission process, you can just have access to this information. I mean, if the information becomes, you know, sort of a, a habitually accessible thing, 
then it's it's in some ways bound to democratize. But we but it's 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 not going to probably fully realize its promise unless we address a lot of systemic issues like equitable funding right off the start, you know, right off the bat. Uh, so that staffing and resources and things like that. But it is, I think it is more difficult for um, school districts to game the system as if you will, um, that if you don't implement performance assessments well, it's probably gonna show. Uh, so that would be my initial volley and I'll sort of step back and let others uh, weigh in if they'd like. Great, Chris. Uh, th thank you, David. And, and I, for me, I think the question and, and Mandy, if you don't mind um, showing up the state of cause and mission slide, um, just to kind of provide some context here. Um, but I think what, when the, where that question stems from is associating in what traditionally has been known in the college and missions world as, as a portfolio, right? As we learned from Common App in the last webinar, right? Like slide room and the implementation of, of a portfolio. But what I, what I think the conversation, what I feel the conversation needs to transition away from is it's, we're not talking about a portfolio that can be quote unquote curated, right? We're talking about a learning experience um, and communicating, for example, in high tech high's case, a deeper learning competency in a way that's just as systemic as, as grades in all the courses, right? So, um, so what you're looking at here, if you haven't seen it, and actually um, I was honored to to know that David Hawkins, back um, in the beginning, he initiated and started uh, the State of College Admissions um, in which they NAC Act surveys uh, admissions um, offices and they kind of associate their levels of importance of each of the, the components of a college application. So that's what you're looking at here um, in 2019. And what I'm looking forward to seeing, and David, you know, we're, we're putting you on the spot, right? Like, as test, test optional grows and grows in this next year, it will be fascinating to watch and see the percentages of that as you look down. Um, and of course, admissions test scores is fourth rank there in terms of considerable importance. Seeing how that might shift, but most importantly, what is gonna be taking its place in terms of percentages, right? Um, is it gonna be the essay? Is it gonna be the recommendation? And then of course, as you see down there, extracurricular activities. Um, so, so I, I just want to kind of maybe say, like, yes, it's, that question is a very good question, but I think what we're also talking about here is how college admissions currently works and how, what colleges emphasize in terms of importance um, and how we are going to be seeing the shift. And now is a great time for RCA and LPI to really put a push to say, okay, here's performance assessment, and now how does that fit college admissions offices into this, into this graph here? No. Yeah, and um, Chris, I think you um, actually just um, kind of previewed some of the questions that we've been getting. Um, before I move to some of the um, questions from our participants, Clea, did you want to add anything else um, ar around this question of exacerbating inequities or um, anything else related to um, use of performance assessment in higher education? No, I think everyone really hit some good points. I really just echoed some of my points. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to open it up to some folks and looking at some of the questions. Many folks have um, asked um, really kind of what Chris hit on towards the end is how can we get higher education to agree to use performance assessment in admissions, placement and advising? Um, and some have even asked, how do you get large institutions to do that? Right. And, um, and, and so this is really kind of the problem um, that RCA is proudly taking on is how can we open up um, the different types of admission submissions um, that students can provide to really show this robust set of competencies that they have in addition to um, understanding content and being ready for um, the rigor of college. And so that's one reason why we have the CUNY report. It shows how a large public school system that has something like 25 colleges um, who, have, um, who are not open admissions, how they use performance assessment specifically for equity to say, okay, if you did not meet the SAT cut score, we're gonna look at performance assessment. Um, we also have you know, many schools and networks like um, the two that are represented today that are creating high quality performance-based assessment. We have groups um, in New Hampshire and in Maine who are working with schools who are doing competency-based learning um, and other organizations like the, Co um, the Coalition for College and Mastery Transcript. So there's a lot of folks out there that are working on this independently. And we're trying to really bring all this together to have some synergy, particularly 
with um, the test optional movement happening. We want to be able to provide higher education in K-12 some other alternatives of what they can think about in terms of what they could submit. So that, that's my long answer about why we're here today and why we've brought David and Clea and Chris and the other webinar where we had MIT, Wheaton, and the one before that where we released the findings from the study with CUNY. Um, so, so I kind of answered that for all of us, but there were at least six different people who, who answered that. Um, and then um, I kind of want to ask David this question that came through, and that are what are more holistic approaches to college applications um, and admittance? Um, well, let me let me first say uh, that there was a question in the chat too about related to your last the answer that you just gave, which is uh, the question in the chat was to the effect of you know our our admission office is aware that if they start adopting this more, it can signal to high schools that the, that th this might be a good thing to, to check out this, this being um, performance assessments and project-based learning. And I think from the very beginning, that's the question that we've posed, that RCA posed to me when, when I first met with them, is that, you know, if admissions could just do this, it would help get us over the hump. And I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, if we can, and this is one of the reasons why NACAC and ACRO have been involved in this. Um, we also think, though, that by adopting these these um, systems, secondary schools have more power than they realize. They're actually, if you all are doing this and doing this well, colleges are going to have to adapt. So it's a it's a bit of a an ecosystem, a circular process. So I want to make sure that those folks who are on this call, who are who are high school members, understand that that you have a lot of power, and, and I encourage you to keep 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 up the the movement. Now, Monica, in terms of what are more holistic practices. Um, you know, you mentioned the MIT approach of looking for school work. I think that probably pops to mind first. Um, the, the second thing that I look at is, you know, the coalition, what led to the coalition for college and their concept of the locker was years of discussion about how do we get more authentic work, more authentic representations of students learning into the process. So that's a big, I mean, that's a big coalition example, literally. You also mentioned that the Common App is involved in this process. So is in the RCA process to deliver that kind of information through the Common Apps tools. Bottom line is that when you, when you think about holistic admission, it's really about looking beyond the factors that were on that table that we just showed. So the the, the possibilities are literally endless. And some institutions, depending on the institutional mission, might look at one set of characteristics and another institution might look at an entirely different set of characteristics. But what is common about it is that they're looking beyond the paper, beyond that one dimensional look at students. So in, in the short time we have to, to talk about it, I think that's how I would generalize about it. And then note that each institution might practice it in a separately, in a slightly different way. Yep. Now, thank you so much. And, and Clea and Chris, this is going to be our last question because we're down to just a couple of minutes, so we can't make the answers too long. But we have a few questions where I think there's still some folks who are not sure what performance assessment can show um, in terms of student preparation for higher education. So one of them, um, I, I really want to honor um, our, OS, our OUSD superintendent who chimed in today, and she wants to know how can they, be, how can they really demonstrate college readiness? Um, what are someone else asked, you know, what about the academic skills and, and these other skills you've talked about? How, how does performance assessment show that is what people are questioning. So big question for, for like two minutes. So one minute each. <laughs> All right, it's Chris or Clea or maybe they want me to answer. Chris? I mean, I'll take a stab at it. I, I, I mean, how do they demonstrate it? And, um, and, 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 and honestly, um, it goes back to that holistic review question um, and how we have demonstrated it through um, bringing, literally bringing admissions officers into our building. I think, and, and, and I guess I'll just highlight the work that you've already referenced, Monica, um, and specifically I've been able to have conversations, and I believe they're on the call as well, but the Mastery Transcript Consortium um, is doing great work in summarizing, right, the deeper learning competencies um, uh, and, and putting it into what the transcript showing mastery of, this, of these deeper learning competencies. Um, and, and connecting with higher edu uh, institutions of higher education to really put it in a format and in a way that is essentially as quickly to read as, um, as looking at a traditional transcript of courses and grades. 
Um, so so I, I guess we, we stumble in answering that question because, of course, there isn't a format out there yet to what I, what I feel can accurately and quickly um, demonstrate the learning. So what we're doing is working within the current system to demonstrate those learning competencies. Again, it's bringing those colleges to campus and all the things that David mentioned um, in terms of educating admissions counselors. Like we're doing a lot of that groundwork so that before an application shows up from a high tech high or in an international school, they have the context of that uh, and that deeper understanding of our environment. So that's, I mean, that's a, maybe a long winded way of showing um, our environment and that our students are college ready. Well, thank you so much, um, Chris and, and David and Clea. And we're going to transition a little bit to kind of some of the takeaways from, from this um, really great webinar with the rich information. And we have lots of questions and we always feel terrible that we can't get to all of them. But it's clear that schools like High Tech High and the International Network Schools produce cultures of care and achievement. They educate high rates of students living in diverse circumstances. They produce graduates of great, great promise and they build students' experience with academic inquiry, feedback, revision, and persistence. The study we're releasing today, assessing college readiness through authentic student work, shows the academic knowledge and dispositions developed by students who attend schools that are part of the New York Standards Consortium, which the International Schools is part of, and High Tech High shares the same practices. When students learn in this way, and you guys have heard us talk about the word deeper learning, this is where they are developing multiple competencies, including content to be ready for college. So for high schools, um, our recommendations for you guys are listed here on this um, deck right here. And you've heard us talk about um, uh, creating meaningful work, creating a school profile, develop partnerships with a set of higher education. And we didn't get to talk a lot about this, but provide the one-on-one -on -one support to juniors and seniors for college counseling. And again, NACAC has a good resource about that. And David says, it's not about the role, it's about the function. Who is helping your students be prepared for college? And then for higher education, what we suggest for folks to think about, which is the next slide, is that just like we talked about before, is you can partner with high school systems that use performance assessment to better understand how students are prepared. You can identify a specific set of knowledge, skills, and abilities that you want to know about students and then think about those best resources for this information. So again, it gets back to the um, single dimensional um, application process. And then we can determine how requested supplemental materials such as performance assessment will be transferred, received and reviewed for admissions. Consider who will review the supplemental materials or performance. Look at our last webinar about how MIT and Wheaton talked about that. But for now, I know we're really short on time, so I wanna be able to thank everybody. So if you have any questions, first of all, do not hesitate to reach out to us. We couldn't cover everything today. A recording of this webinar, as well as all of our resources we've shared today will be sent out via email. Please visit our website in a few days to get a summary of this webinar, as well as the video. The paper, College Readiness Through Authentic Assessment, is also available on our website. And we hope you'll join us for continued programming in the Reimagining College Access series this fall. I guess that's my dog you're hearing. To stay up to date about future engagements, please join the RCA mailing list. Thank you again to our presenters for sharing that valuable information about how to connect performance assessment to higher education and success. And another big thanks to our partners, Education Council, Dan Gordon and Joe Fretwell, who created this webinar. Our partners and presenters also have some wonderful resources available outside of this chat. And my deepest apology to end the webinar like this. We have to count on one big Zoom bomb and it seems to be my dog and somebody knocking at the door. My deepest apologies and thank you very much for today.